great days to watch uh, events. I don't say that you'll enjoy all of them, but uh, it's good to see things that's happening and know that we have a God that is right on time. What he has said is going to come to pass. Nothing can stop it, and uh, it's our uh, responsibility to watch. Uh, Jesus said, Beware, lest these days come upon you unaware. And uh, if we watch things that's happening, and I, I, I'm, this is before the lesson, but I was reading an article the other day, and we had been talking about oil, and uh, I made the statement that uh, uh, the first prime minister of Israel said that he had one thing against Moses. He wandered 40 years in the wilderness, and then when he decided to come out, they went to a country that there wasn't a drop of oil. Well... I got something tonight, and I want, you, I want to give it to you so you, you can watch. Zion Oil Company, Zion Oil and Gas Company, uh, it's owned by John Brown, president. That sounds like a good Oklahoma name. <clears throat> and he has been standing on Scripture, and uh, he went to the uh, Israeli parliament, put in for a permit to drill for oil in Israel on the basis of uh, three prophecies and we want to watch and see what transpires in this they they approved the permit uh last week and he will be uh, working on that the scriptures i've got uh that he gave is ezekiel write these down if you will or we'll try to turn there uh, ezekiel 36 11 deuteronomy 33 24 and genesis 49 22 through 26 uh, let's get Ezekiel 36, 11, and I'll read them, and you can underline them. And uh, we will watch and see that this come to pass. I'll read the whole thing. And I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they shall increase and bring forth fruits. And I will settle you according to your old estate. That's the whole covenant of Israel. And will do... <clears throat> better unto you than at your beginning, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Now, uh, just let me give you a minute here to think. God's saying, I'm going to do better for you than I did at the beginning. And at the beginning, he blessed them with so much that they had to say, don't send anymore. You remember when they was building the ark and all the furnishings of the tabernacle? Uh, those people had so much to give. give when they come out of Egypt they took Egypt's resources and wealth with them. And uh, they were so blessed. And God says, I'm going to do more for you at the end than I did at your beginning. And uh, in David's time and in Solomon's time, Israel was the most powerful nation on the face of the earth and the most wealthy nation on the face of the earth. But God is saying, in the time when I settle you, and they've been settled, not all of them, but they've been settled in their land, I'm going to do more and bless you more than I did in the beginning. This gentleman took that, and he began to pray concerning that, uh, that God would show him where there was oil. Look in Deuteronomy 33, 24. And let's read the other scripture that he took. Speaking of the tribe of Asher. And of Ash, he's, he's talking about the different tribes and where he put them and what their inheritance would be. And of Asher, he said, Let Asher be blessed with children. Let him be acceptable to his brethren. And let him dip his foot in oil. And Asher and Joseph is where he's dwelling. Genesis 49, 22. Let's pick that one up. Don't you love God's Word? He's always right on time. Genesis 49, 22. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall. Then look down in 26. The blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills, they shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate 
from his brethren. I might have missed one there, 22 through 26. I'll get the whole thing. The archers have harassed him and shot at him and hated him, but his bow bowed in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. And there is the shepherd, uh, the stone of Israel, by the God of thy father who shall help thee, and by the Almighty who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above blessings, listen to this, of the deep that lieth under blessings of the breasts and of the womb. He's talking about the depths of the earth. And oil is the deepest thing in the earth, oil and coal. Everything else lays on bedrock. Oil and coal formulates under bedrock. So these are some things that you could be watching for. And uh, if God said it, it's in the book. And if he's uh, putting his faith in that, it will come to pass. Okay, let's go to Second Peter tonight, 1 and 21. Give you a little while to get there. And 21. For the prophecy came not at any time by the will of men. I'll read that again. For the prophecy came not at any time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Have you ever uh, talked to someone and uh, uh, they uh, tell you that the Old Testament is not relevant to today? And uh, then they will tell you that uh, uh, the Old Testament contradicts itself and uh, we can only go by the New Testament. Well, let me tell you something. The Old Testament is prophecy, as we just read. The New Testament is the history of that prophecy. The first thing that we have in Scripture is Genesis 3:15 and 16. That's the first prophecy God gave, and Jesus Christ fulfilled that. You can't ask for a better a prophetic word to be given and a better historical event to fulfill it. And that is just what prophecy is. It is history predicted. And uh, I want to talk to you tonight for a while on the wonders of prophecy. Uh, it, we can read the Old Testament, and it's wonderful. We, we read what God says through the mouths of holy men that were anointed of the Holy Ghost, like Peter said. And uh, we will read that. And then if we don't know what happened, uh, and if we don't know how to find what happened, it is up here, uh, but we don't see the fulfillment of it. Uh, that it's altogether different in, in, than in the New Testament because prophecy there was uh, fulfilled in, in many instances. And we're talking tonight and last week and the week before, and we're going to be going for, Paul said, about eight months. So we're going to see a lot of prophecy out of the New Testament fulfilled as it was in the Old Testament. And uh, I, I hope that you'll take notes and stay with me because you'll see things in the Scriptures that I don't touch on, and it's always good for you to have that because God will quicken it to you. So prophecy from Genesis 3 to Revelation 21 is how uh, God spoke and when they came to pass and when they were fulfilled. Uh, fulfillment of prophecy is the uncontestable testimony of the accuracy of Scripture. Now let me say that again. Fulfillment of prophecy. God has said is the uncontest, unrefutable testimony to the accuracy of Scripture. Uh, give you an example. Jesus coming in the likeness of sinful flesh fulfilled more prophecies concerning him in the Old Testament than is concerning him in the New Testament. So his coming was prophesied, and when he did come, the events that transpired in his life was the history that backed up the prophecy in the Old Testament. This is why we're concerned about prophecy. Uh, we can go to where it is written and given, and then we can go and find in history where it actually took place, and anyone that tries to refute what you say, you say, just a minute, I've got it right here in black and white where it actually took place. So it's good to know 
uh, what God has said, but it's also good to know how he brought it to pass. And he is so perfected in what he says. We'll, we'll deal with that a little bit tonight and next week. Uh, but what he says is in, in uh, just detail, very clear detail. And four, five hundreds later, uh, two, three hundred years later, it comes to pass, and it is exactly like he said that it would come to pass. Even the, the same words, the same material or whatever. Uh, God has not left him himself without witness. Uh, prophecy, like I read in Peter 2, 121, prophecy is God speaking through men and God making it good. Now, God can take a man. We, we read uh, as prophets in the Old Testament, and people say, well, I, I can't believe that. He was a sheep herder, or he was a farmer, or uh, he was uh, this or that. It doesn't matter what he was. The fact that he spoke under the anointing of the Holy Ghost is God using a vessel just like you to say what he wants to say to people that have ears to hear, let them hear, Right? So that's what prophecy is. It's God speaking and God making it good. Numbers 23, 19, God says, Have I not spoken, saith the Lord, and shall I not make it good? You see, if God uses one of us to prophesy, uh, and it is of the Lord, you are anointed to do so, the once it comes out of your mouth, your responsibility is done. You don't have to pray that God will make it good. You don't have to worry about it coming to pass. You have fulfilled your purpose, which is the vessel of the Holy Spirit, and God is on the line to make it come to pass. Uh, <clears throat> that's the good part of it. Uh, prophetic words of God and their fulfillment are the divine proof of the authenticity of Scripture. And I wish you would remember that. Uh, if you run into an agnostic or uh, an unbeliever or a skeptic or whatever, and he criticizes the Word of God, have something in the New Testament to show him or her, and then go back and say, uh, just let me show you where that actually was spoken of God. And it came to pass. So uh, that's what the prophetic <coughs> or the historical uh, responsibility is. It's to take back and go back to where it was uh, uh, actually given. The divine proof of the intensity of the Scripture is the prophetic words of most countries and cities, mentioned them many times in Scripture. And uh, he fulfilled prophecy and witnessed to it by history. How and when did it come to pass? It'll come to pass over years, as I said a moment ago. Uh, he might give it, and it might be 400 years before it comes to pass. But when it does, it is exactly like he said it would be. Don't we serve a great God? He doesn't forget. Uh, he didn't go to sleep somewhere waiting for somebody to wake him up. He is always on time. He is always on target. What he said will come to pass, and I'm glad I know him. Hallelujah. So prophecies that are broad and cover many years of time, and I'll give you a few of them that did, uh, is concerning Israel. We've been talking about how long Persia, Nineveh, Jerusalem, Damascus, Tyre, Sidon, Memphis, Thebes, and other people and places... It took a long time for what God said would come to pass, and they were all prophesied by different men, and they were all in different localities, and they were all in different times. Their word is a chain of truth through the Bible that men cannot refute. Landmarks of Scripture, we need them to know them and uh, to convince ourselves of the authenticity of prophecy. Also, to rebuke the devil and his seed of the lies. Uh, let me say this in passing. You need to read the Old Testament. Say amen, Brother Tilly. Amen. Say I do it, Brother Tilly. Well, I lost two-thirds of you there. Because some people find the Old Testament boring. Uh, when I uh, first got saved, I, I always loved to read, and uh, I loved history. And uh, naturally, they started me in Genesis and shoved me and said, start reading. And I did, and I found I had the most exciting book in my hand than you could get. 
Uh, I, I just loved it. And uh, all those things that God said using men, I didn't understand a lot of it, uh, but I was lost in the Old Testament and the New Testament as well. So we need to know them and these things to convince ourselves and people that we witness to of the authenticity of prophecy. Uh, <clears throat> Jesus' resurrection was immediately challenged. Whenever he came and John the Baptist pointed him out as the Son of God, it was immediately challenged. They didn't believe it. They didn't accept it. And uh, it's the first prophecy in Scripture. And it's the last prophecy in Scripture. The last words concerning Jesus are the first words. In Genesis 3.15, God says, I'm going to send your seed made of the flesh, and he will uh, bruise the devil's head, he will bruise his heel. And that prophecy went all the way down through the Old Testament, spoken by different people, Isaiah mostly probably. Uh, David in the Psalms 22 was all about the coming of the Lord, what was going to happen to him, and into the New Testament, into all the books of the New Testament. Sixty-six books talk about him coming, what he was going to do, about his leaving, and the very last words of the book is this, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Now, there is a chain, a golden chain, a prophecy all the way through the book. I, I, I kind of I, I believe that God likes to stir up our imagination. It tells us just a little bit here that's a tidbit, and you've done this with your children, and then just sets back and watches them wait with anticipation, especially around December 25th. I think our Father is kind of like that. <clears throat> so we're going to talk tonight about uh, Egypt. It, it'll take me, well, I'll go slow. And if we don't get there, I've got some people to help me read tonight because I just had uh, uh, too many. But <clears throat> Egypt was the oldest and uh, one of the major world powers back in the very beginning. And uh, its eminence in science and arts and revine culture and luxury and what's known and remembered uh, in nation, by the nation in Scripture. Uh, it has the most fulfilled prophecies. Now listen to this. Egypt, as you see it today, you would never know it, but it has more fulfilled prophecies and the most testimonies of fulfilled Old Testament prophecies. That's Egypt, the one we know today. It is the one country that has the highest eminence in science and arts in discoveries. If you read the paper, I think it was last Friday, uh, you will find that they found another uh, pyramid, and it turned out to be one of those pharaohs' mother, they believe. So there's always something that they're discovering uh, that has defied the ravages of time, uh, and it points back to the monuments that record the greatness of Egypt. It was a great, great nation. Uh, in Jesus' day, even though it had been conquered by uh, various conquerors, uh, the, uh, uh, what's the one in, uh, one that had the statue made of him? Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar. <coughs> Nebuchadnezzar <coughs> captured it twice and uh, destroyed a lot of it. But it endured, and down through the years, it, uh, it still flourished. Uh, Caesar Augustus took it uh, for Rome, and uh, it was so rich in grain and uh, agriculture uh, that he paid Rome's debts from Egypt's granaries. Now, this is after God put his hand on it. God had already prophesied that Egypt was going to be a blighted nation, and uh, as some of the folks read tonight, but still, God blessing upon it. Now, Babylon, he destroyed it. Nineveh, he would have destroyed it, except they repented. Tyre, he completely destroyed it. Sidon, he completely destroyed it. And all of the other, Assyria, and uh, some of the other great nations, whenever he said, I'm going to bring judgment to you, and it came, he put his thumb on it, and those nations ceased to be anything. But he had mercy on Egypt. And I think the reason, when you go back through the Old Testament, you'll find that the Egyptian pharaoh showed mercy to Abraham. 
and then he showed mercy to Isaac, and then uh, Joseph came along, and he showed grace and mercy to him, and put him over all of the substance and the riches of Egypt. And then uh, Jacob's or uh, Joseph's par- uh, J- Jacob and, and all of his brethren came, and he showed mercy to them, and he gave them the richest land in Egypt uh, to uh, feed their flock. And then when Jesus came, and Herod was going to kill all the babies, two years old and up, he went down to Egypt, and Egypt showed mercy to him, even though they was under a Roman conquest at that time. Uh, he was accepted there and stayed there until the threat was over. And uh, I think that's why perhaps God, even though he has destroyed them as far as uh, their greatness is concerned, uh, he has uh, shown mercy to them also. And Alex- or A- Alexandria, I think it's still in existence today, it's nothing, but it's still there, uh, was second only to Rome in uh, the, uh, what do you call it, the arcs and all of that. Uh, what is that called? Huh? Okay, culture. They was <coughs> second only to Rome in their culture. And uh, today, it isn't that way. Okay, I gave out some numbers, so who did I give Ezekiel twenty nine fourteen to? Read it real loud. Okay, now what was those last two words? Listen to this. A base kingdom. And take what I said a moment ago of what Egypt used to be and what it is today. You have a base kingdom. Uh, No one wants it. Now down through the years, it has been conquered by uh, this king and that king and that king and that king. And even... Uh, different nations in in recent years, uh, up until 1946, it was under the control of the British Empire, uh, and it was a dead weight around every one of their necks. And uh, it, today uh, they have their freedom, but it's it's a base nation. To put it bluntly, it's a welfare nation. Our country, the United States, pours millions into it just to keep it afloat, and other nations do as well. So what God has said about it, <coughs> it came to pass. Uh, Ezekiel 29 through 19. Now listen to this and read it in your Bible. Ezekiel 20, go there quick, ninth verse through the ninth, and you'll see what God has to say about Egypt.
Okay, this is speaking mostly of Israel after God brought them out of Egypt. But he brought them out rich. <clears throat> he brought them out in multitudes. He brought them out not one sick one among them, not one weak one among them. Uh, their shoes didn't wear out. And they were a nation, even though they came out of what at that time was captivity <clears throat> by a heathen nation, God had blessed them. But in doing so, they went back to the practices of what they had learned in Egypt, and that is uh, idolatry. Uh, they were rebellious, and you know the story of them being 40, 40 years in the wilderness. They picked that up in Egypt. Okay, conquest to conquest. Uh, Egypt became an unbearable burden around the neck of conquerors. Its greatness faded, and it became, as I said a moment ago, a welfare nation. It is uh, greatness and glory had faded away a total decline, and no extinction. Yet God said that he would judge them, he would do all this to them, but he did not say that he would completely destroy them. And we know today that uh, that is true. Uh, Ezekiel thirty thirteen. I gave that to someone. Okay, uh, let me get paper straightened out here. Ezekiel thirty thirteen. Is that what that was, Don? Thirty thirteen. I might have wrote that down wrong. I'm looking for one. Okay, well we'll go on. It'll, uh, I wrote one of those letters down wrong. <clears throat> It'll come back up probably in another page. But Egypt had, uh, their capital was Thebes, T-H-E-B-E-S. And uh, it was the prince of pride, wealthy city, until 89 B.C. And then it was besieged, conquered, and uh, after three years of battle, it was completely leveled, and its multitudes were cut off. Uh, Egypt was conquered by Nebuchadnezzar, as I said a moment ago, and uh, even though uh, they, uh, the people returned, but they was never a prominent nation again. I gave someone Ezekiel 34 through 6, especially 6. Who did I give that to? Okay. Notice that said the Lord God. The foundations are broken down. Her pride shall come down. And I would say tonight that that's a good example for America. We are such a, a prideful nation and an unthankful nation that it would do us good to remember. It doesn't matter how intelligent we are, uh, what our culture is, or how great our prominence is as far as the world is concerned. It forget is going to come down. And we have forgot God. I said we have forgot God. Okay. <clears throat> Ezekiel twenty nine fifteen. I gave that to someone. Okay, that's the uh, same part that uh, Wilma was uh, saying. So it's a, it's a good example, and God has left it there, I believe, for every nation to see as an example. Rome has came and gone. Uh, great nations have come and gone. And uh, they were destroyed for idolatry, for uh, different things that just uh, defy the imagination, and uh, Egypt also, for that matter. But God left them, I believe, because of the mercy.